see everyone uh, this morning as we uh, continue to make our way through uh, these phases. Uh, we keep on inching forward. I know we're, uh, I can't keep track but of everything going in, but we're in phase two. So uh, as long as we, our numbers change like that, we're doing good going forward. I don't want to go back to phase one or even phase phase zero where we're all totally uh, locked in, but uh, we are slowly moving that way. Um, the psalmist, when he says, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go in the house of the Lord, that takes a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Uh, praise God that he has given us technology to use. We can praise God that we are reaching people that normally wouldn't be here. But boy, there is something special about being able to come together with church family uh, and corporately worship our Lord and Savior. Uh, there is an encouragement that, that comes. Uh, you read about all, all different ones that, especially through this uh, coronavirus that get to a point and feel like there, there is no hope. Sadly, we've read stories of doctors that have been on the front lines that just can't deal with it anymore. And I know of two I've read of that have taken their own lives based on what uh, they have seen. And those that don't have a relationship with Christ and those that don't have a church family, I don't know how they make it in life. Well, the truth is you can't make it in life without our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with a church family where we can gain encouragement and love. And, and it is good to see uh, those that can make it back as we worship together. And that's why we're here today. Before we worship in song, let's worship in prayer, okay? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you that once again you are allowing us to, to meet back together. Lord, even though things aren't back quite to normal, Lord, we're seeing your hand and, and we're moving forward. Lord, we are gaining encouragement from each other, and we thank you for this day, Lord, that we are here to worship you. Lord, we look outside and we behold uh, the weather, and, and Lord, your creation just screams your name. And so, Lord, as we were coming in into this place to corporately worship, Lord, we are worshiping you by what we see and experience. Lord, we worship you because of Jesus and the cross. Lord, in the forgiveness of sins and, and the hope of eternity in heaven. Lord, we come before you this morning as, as uh, things that are in this world are still on our hearts and minds, Lord. And we pray for the, the frontline workers, Lord. We thank you for their willingness to serve. And Lord, just give them the strength that they need to continue. Lord, we pray for those that have been affected by this virus. Lord, we praise you, those that have, that have been healed. Lord, and as a testimony to your goodness and greatness. Lord, there are families that have lost loved ones during this time, Lord. And we ask that during this time, as you, as you make yourself known and seen and felt, Lord, that you would just comfort them. Lord, most of all, we pray that your message continues to go out. The message of hope, the message of peace that can only be found through Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we, we pray these prayers. Amen.
Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God that we can trust and obey. Lord, we ask that you help us to do that very thing. Lord, help us to trust your word. Help us to obey your word. Lord, as you Speak to us this morning, Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would listen and we would follow. Lord, we ask that you bless the reading of your word this morning. And Lord, may your message speak to us. May we listen and do. We love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. For the next few weeks, I want us to to, uh, think about this thought of what our final destination is. What is our final destination? You know, when life begins, 
And it does begin at conception, amen? When life begins, we find ourselves on a journey. And that journey will have many ups and downs. We may hit a few speed bumps. In this life's journey, we may, we may hit a few chug holes. And you know when you hit those chug holes just right, uh, you got to take that car in and, and get some alignment work. And, and in our lives, many times we hit those chug holes in, in this, this journey. And we got to get realigned sometimes. Sometimes in this journey, we find ourselves off track and, and decide, well, this may look like a shorter or easier way, and so I'm going to go this way, when we know deep down we should have gone that way. I know that doesn't happen to everyone, but some of us are always looking for that, that shortcut in, in this journey, and, you know, an easier, not so rocky uh, road that we're on. Sometimes this journey finds us on the side of the road. We get refueled and we go. But with every journey, there is a final destination. And in the life that you and I live, there's going to be a final destination. And when we talk to each other and, and talk about the journeys, well, where are we going to end up? And, and it's many places. We've gone on these journeys and, and we've left one area to go to another area. It may be a move. It may be a vacation. It, it may be a meeting. But when we talk about uh, this journey of life that we find ourselves on, there's only one of two places that, that we can end up. On this life journey, the final destination is one of two places. We have heaven or we have hell. And the thing about hell is, sadly, it seems to be a forgotten doctrine. You go, to a, you go to a Bible bookstore and you go ask to look for the, the commentary section, the, the theology section, and, and I want a commentary on hell. Guess what? Sadly, you find books on everything else except hell. You, find, you can go to the Bible bookstores and, and there's trinkets and, and all we have, the, the, the picture frames that, that make our, our houses look good. And we have the jewelry section and, and there may be the, the, t there's the, the, t the witness t-shirt section and, and we go look for the most trendy t-shirt. There's the music section. There's, there's the Christian books that we like to read and the authors that we like to read. And, but when it comes to hell, there's not a whole lot out there. When you come to think of it, compared to all the messages that we've heard and, and looking out in, in, in the, the crowd that we have today, and those that may be watching, we've heard no, numerous messages through the, through the years. In comparison, how many times have we heard a message on hell compared to every other message that we may have heard? Sadly, the numbers don't com compare. But did you know that in the Bible, there is more about hell in Scripture than we read about heaven? Think about that. Are you opening up God's Word? There's more about hell than there is about heaven. Did you know that, that Jesus preached about hell? And our text today that we'll read was part of a message that Jesus Christ preached. Listen, if we really believe in hell, guess what? It will change you and it will change our church. Here's what has happened in society. So-called preachers have come on. 
and have stopped preaching about hell because it's not an easy subject. They stop preaching about hell because it, it makes people feel bad. We've gone in, into a, 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 a religious rut and that we want to preach what makes people happy. One was asked why, wasn't, why he doesn't preach about hell. He said, people already feel guilty enough. They, don't, uh, uh, they know they're not doing what they should, raising their kids. We, we can all find reasons. So I want them to come to our church or our meetings and, and want to be lifted up. And, and up to say, you know what? I may not be perfect, but I'm moving forward. My friends, this life that we're on isn't about moving forward. I don't know about you. I don't want to move forward. I want to move upward. He goes on. I think that motivates you and it motivates me to do better. Another pastor, well-known preacher, recently came out saying that everyone's going to be saved. There's no such thing as hell. And he now openly ridicules the idea of hell. He asks, with billions and bill will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? And if that's the case, how do you become one of the few? What kind of God is that that we would need to be rescued from, from this God, my friends? It's not about being rescued from God. Is about being rescued from our sins. And how could that God ever be good? God is good. God is gracious. But God is also a holy and righteous God. And he goes on, how could that ever be good news? The good news is that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins so that we could have a relationship with that holy and righteous God. Another well-known pastor from our area made this comment, a, a person who spends every day getting drunk will ruin their health and, and marriage, family and career. They will make their lives a, a living hell, he uses, but that still falls fall, far short of the chronic alcoholic being condemned by a just God to literally burn in hell forever and ever. For others, it may be very well be that the punishment merited by their sins is greater than what they receive in this life. For those people, perhaps there will be some kind of punishment after death, but we believe that it will be remedial and corrective rather than punishment for punishment's sake. Exactly what that will be and how long will last, we don't know. Will hell for some people last 10 minutes or 10 million years? We don't know, but this we do know. Hell will not last for eternity. It will not be endless don't sin be reunited with god now rather than after you have put yourself and those you love through hell my friends this is what is in society we don't like talking about hell there are those that have taken scripture and have screwed it and, and messed it up and, and teaching a, a, a doctrine a, a, a teaching that that is so far removed uh, an important part in our lives we think that this coronavirus is bad we look and we see those that have lost their lives and we see the suffering my friends there's something far more worse than any coronavirus could ever give and that is an eternity in hell we're not talking about minutes when we open up God's word, and we'll see here in just a moment, it's not about just a, a five-minute punishment, I'm going to stand in the corner. It's not a place that, that, that God is just mean and allows people to go. But when we're on, when you are on this life journey, and when we get to the end of life and, and there is a final destination, one of two places, it's not because God has chose you to go there, it's because you chose yourself to end up where you're at. Let us look this morning in Luke chapter 16. 
Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, there was a certain ma rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, Lee lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the, the tip of his finger in water and to cool my tongue, for I am tormented. I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from hence then he said i pray thee therefore father can you imagine okay if you can't if you can't send someone if you can't send abraham to, to just tip his, his finger in water and just just give me a, a cooling of the tongue if you can't do that he says, well, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that may testify to them, lest they do come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went up unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What sad words. Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man, clothed in purple, fine linen, enjoying life. Never given a second thought. Comes to the end of his, his life journey, his, his final destination. One day he's alive, enjoying life. The next day he is dead, and, he, and, he in, and he's in hell in torment. Lazarus not enjoying life. Suffering. But sometime in his life journey... Realized that it wasn't about his suffering right now, but it's what was waiting for him and put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And, and goes from, and he dies. And he wakes up and realizes, oh, the truth of God's word. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the truth and the promises that I placed my life on some time ago. Can you imagine What Lazarus was going through. It says he was sickly. He was poor. All he could get was the crumbs off of the table. They, they knew each other. We don't know how, but, but you, the, the rich man would at least pass by. And the, Lazarus was there every day just getting the scraps. The dogs were coming and licking Lazarus' sores. And we see a distinction between the two. They end up. You know, their final destination, their choice by life. The rich man ends up in hell, Lazarus in heaven. I want us to look at hell this morning because we don't look at it enough and we don't talk about it enough. For many, hell has just become a curse word. We're not uncomfortable about hell because of what awaits for those that are unredeemed. We're not comfortable about hell and, and those that refuse Jesus Christ and their eternal destination. 
We're going through Revelation in Sunday school. And for many, it may be, hey, I'm glad I'm not going there. There's some things that are going to take place. That it's some scary times, let's be honest. But it's easy to say, hey, at least I'm not going there. At least I know where I'm heading. And, and many times, that's as far as we get. And for many, hell is just a curse word. And that's what bothers us about hell. Hell. I'll be honest, I tried to think of a, a real spiffy uh, title. But all I came up with was the horrors of hell. Because as I looked and, and I just ran a, a search, I'm thinking, I wonder what people's reaction would be if, if how we used hell in, in a title based on what hell really is. And, and I was looking at, listen to some of these. What would your reaction be? Well, this one's not too bad. Four steps to hell. That, that, was a, that was a message I found. Here's another title. Hell no, hell yes. Another one I found was this. What does hell got to do with it? Another guy preached a message that said, a place hotter than hell. One guy titled this, what in hell do you want? That's a pretty logical question, but the way we look at hell, we, uh, to us it's just a, a, a curse word. It's something that, that I'm not allowed to say, and, and I'll get in trouble. Another one was, what in hell is good? I mean, we, we are so programmed. Becky and I were talking about the message, and we started laughing. Because Brandon used to use this phrase. I didn't ask permission to use them today, and I don't know, I'll, I'll do something later to make up for it. But Brandon you would used to set, talk about going to heaven, and we'd get all excited, right? How many is excited about going to heaven? Especially with everything going on? This world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. Coronavirus, you can stay here, but I got a house somewhere beyond the blue. But Brown would say, oh, excited about going to heaven. And then there's that other place. It wasn't heaven and hell, but it was heaven and, ooh, that, that, that other place. And you know what? We, we treat that just like that. We like heaven. We like all the goodness about heaven and what awaits us, but, but we, we don't even want hell to be in our vocabulary. But my friends, the deal is, I want us to realize this morning, hell is a reality. And because hell is a reality, it ought to form how we conduct and how we think, not that we're going to hell. But my friends, there are people that are dying every single day in their sins without a clue about Jesus Christ. And just like the rich man, guess what? They were living life and thinking everything was okay. And they wake up the next day and they know that they're in torment in hell. My friends, that should bring us sorrow. How many were going through life and had everything planned out and this virus hit? Well, it hasn't affected me. Well, it's getting a whole lot closer. It affected us enough that we couldn't meet for a few weeks. But what about those that were just going through life? And they contracted this virus. Ended up passing away. And just like the rich man, they found out soon enough that hell was a reality. 
we get a picture in Revelation about hell. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9, And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels. And in the presence of the Lamb, the, uh, the smoke of the torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. My friends, hell is a reality. It is all through Scripture in the Old Testament. The, 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 the term Sheol is used some 65 times, 31 times used as the grave, 31 times used as hell, three times it's described as a pit. Job described hell in Job chapter 10 as a place of darkness. The New Testament uses the word Hades and Gehenna. Jesus used the word Gehenna to, to describe uh, hell, except for James chapter 3 and verse 6. The, the, the meaning of the, the, the word Gehenna used for hell, Jesus used. And it was derived from, from the valley of Hinnom, who it was traditionally considered a place the Jews uh, thought of as a final uh, punishment of the ungodly just south of Jerusalem. Here we think of Jerusalem and going up to Jerusalem and there was the temple worship and everything that went on in Jerusalem. But just south, outside the walls and the gate was a valley considered to be the boundary between the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And it was in this place human sacrifices were offered to Molech. It was in this place that, that the altars were destroyed by Josiah. It was in this place that the valley was later declared to be the valley of, of the slaughter by Jeremiah. It was in this place that was used as, as a perpetual burning uh, for garbage and a burial place for criminals. And can you imagine the, the stench and the odor and the, the continuous smoke. Can you imagine the talk that went on? Parents telling their kids, you don't want to go to this place. Stay away. This was a place worse than a dump. And so when Jesus talked about hell, it wasn't some fictitious myth. It was a reality. It was an actual place. And the moment the rich man died, he realized just how much hell was a reality. My friends, we know people that do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may be here this morning. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this message is for you. You may be saved. And you can say, Pastor Scott, I know I can go back to a time in my life. I realized I was a sinner, and I realized what Jesus did on the cross for my sins, and I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Praise God. What a great testimony. But guess what? This message is for you because each and every one of us know people that need a relationship with Jesus that have never experienced the hope and peace that comes from a forgiveness of sins and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this message is for us to spur us to tell people that hell is real. It is a reality. And it awaits those that refuse Jesus Christ. Hell's a reality. As we look at hell as a reality, hell is also a place of, of agony. It says that, that the rich man died. Woke up in hell in torment. 
Now, when you look at the definition for torment, it comes up, it, it's this, painted to extremity, teased, harassed, pain. Lifting up his eyes in torment, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in torment. I am constantly harassed. I am teased uh, to, to the extremity, to, to the fullest amount. I just need some comfort, my friends. Once hell is that final destination, there is no comfort. It is a place of torment. It is a place of agony. The rich man lifting up his eyes. But my friends, not only the rich man, but every single person that have died in their sins and have woken up in hell are in torment. But we see in Scripture of hell, not only a place of torment, but it's a place that says of, of gnashing of teeth. The grinding teeth, uh, you, you, such uh, intense things, huh? just grinding teeth. The, the picture of, of this gnashing of teeth. Have you ever been so mad and so angry that you just gnash your teeth together? What's so bad about hell is even though there are those in torment, there are those that are still so angry, wanting to raise their fists to, to God and just gnashing of their teeth, that even in torment, refusing to admit that they were wrong and that Jesus Christ is right. Not only of gnashing of teeth, but we see in Scripture, it is a place of darkness. The outer darkness of, of judgment accompanied by weeping and gnashing of teeth. The inner pain and the outer pain taken with complete darkness. Can you imagine a place like that? Is hell becoming real? Not because a, a pastor is talking about hell. My friends, God's word speaks about hell. And we know people that are he heading in that direction on their destination. And this awaits them. I wouldn't be so worried about Revelation. I'm more worried about hell. People want to know about what's going to happen in Revelation. Well, I'll tell you, in the middle, we talk about their very beginning. John writes about the seven churches. We see the seven ages of the church age, and we see things apply. We get to right before chapter 4. You want me to tell you what I believe happens? Jesus comes and, and bring, get picks, or gets the redeemed. We see in chapter 4 and chapter 5, worship going on like never before. I like what Brother Charlie says. He, he corrected me one time a while back. I made a comment about practice makes perfect. And he came out, and, and the only way that Brother Charlie can, he says, uh, Preacher, that only works if practice makes perfect only works if you practice perfectly. I've tried to watch saying practice makes perfect. But when it comes to worship, if we practice perfectly here on earth, we'd be more ready when we get to heaven because chapter four or chapter four and five talk about the worship that's going to go on around the throne. Oh my goodness, what a day that will be. <laughs> Forgetting about the crowns. They're just going to the feet of Jesus. Okay, see, as Christian, he is worthy of it all. 
And then you know what we find after that is in chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and as we go into Revelation, there are going to be some bad things happen. And we have seven years. We talk about a millennium. But even with seven years and a millennium, guess what? There is a beginning time and an ending time. We talk about, we see in Revelation about heaven, and oh, I can't wait to get there. Can you imagine the golden streets and the pearly gates? We talk about a mansion in heaven. Well, you can differ in whatever you think about that mansion. I like what Jesus says. He's building me a house in his father's house. I'm going to have a room in my father's house. That's how big God's mansion is. Even if I had one, it would not compare to where God is. But in all that, guess what? There's a beginning and an end. But hell, there is no end. With hell, my friends, it is an eternity, a place of agony. We see in Matthew chapter 13 and, and verse 36 through 50, as Jesus talks about uh, the kingdom of, of heaven, like, like a treasure that's hid in a field and, and, a, and, and a, a merchant seeking goodly pearls. He talks about the kingdom of heaven like a net that was cast in the sea and gathered uh, fish of every kind. It says they, they pulled ashore and sat down and gathered the good in the vessel and cast the bad away. And he says, so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just. And it shall cast them in the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This description of what hell is like. In a place of agony, but it's also a place of, of such a stench. In Revelation chapter 14, we see the same shall drink of the wine of wrath of God, which is poured out and without mixture in the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. We see in Revelation chapter 19, the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These were cast into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone brimstone we see in revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all lighters shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death you know what brimstone is sulfur have you ever smelt sulfur have you ever smelt rotten eggs? To me, that's what it smells. Can you imagine a life not only of pitch blackness and of agony, a place of, of gnashing of teeth, but it's also a place of, of such a stench. Not only that, if you were just to breathe it here constantly, it's toxic and dangerous. Here on earth, if you breathe so much in, you can die. But can you imagine being in a place where there is no death that is eternal? Not only a place of agony, but a place where there is a, a permanent respiratory problem and, 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 and ch this choking and irritation. My friends, you never die in hell. And so whatever problems, that whatever issues are with, that you would face day in, day out, every moment, can't see, gnashing of teeth, in agony, awfulest stench, not only burning because of fire, but eternal issues dealing with irritation. It's a place of agony, but we see in Scripture that, that hell is eternal. It's not just a come and go thing. It's not a make-believe thing. It's not a, a good s story that you can put into a movie and think, oh, everything's going to be okay. It's eternal. We see in Matthew chapter 25. Verse 
verse 41 and 46 talking about everlasting fire everlasting punishment revelation 14 11 and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and they had no rest day or night my friends this is what hell is all about it is a place of torment a place of agony but it is eternal it does not end the man the rich man died and he woke up in heaven he was conscious through it all his eternity based on his decision on earth was fixed there was no change in that destination once it's chosen and once life death hits life whatever decision you made it's eternal you see hell awaits those also that reject jesus christ See, it was too late. The rich man, oh, if you can't, if you can't just ease my torn with just a drop of water, can you send Abraham, can, can you send someone to talk? I have five brothers back home. If, if someone from the dead would just go to them. How crazy is that? If someone from the dead came and talked to me, I'd probably be fainting. Think about that. Someone from the dead is going to come tell me about and what, what did Abraham say? He says, listen, you have the prophets. You have Moses. You have God's word. If they don't listen to God's word, they're not going to listen to someone from the dead. What does God's word state? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're headed down a road that we don't want to go to without Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death. But, oh, the agony that, that awaits those that, that die in, in their sins, and that payment is death. But, the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. People ask, why does God send people to hell? He doesn't send people to hell. Hell was not created for you. He wasn't crea it wasn't created for people. It was created for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them, On the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. What? Prepared for the devil and his angels. God uses hell, though, to deal righteously with unbelievers that he, he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But because God is holy and God is righteous, he must deal with sin. It's not that God sends the drunk or the drug addict or the prostitute. And we look at those and we think they, they get what they deserve. But you know what? We're going to be surprised that there's going to be a lot of church members that are in hell. People that we're, we're just blown. There's going to be people in heaven like, how in the world did you get in? I knew what you were like back on earth. How did you get in? Praise God, Jesus gave me a chance, and I put my faith and trust in Jesus. I don't understand it all, but I'm here, and my sins are forgiven. And then there's that one that we remember this sin, and they were at church every time the doors were open. Anytime they were asked to do something, they were there. They may have sung in the choir. They may have taught a Sunday school class. They may have drove the van to camp. That right there should rate merit, right? But because they did not put their faith and trust in Jesus, just like the rich man, they wake up in heaven.
God doesn't want to send people there, but God, being holy and righteous, must deal with sin. Ezekiel chapter 33 and 11 says this, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? See, that's Old Testament. We find in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. Aren't you glad? You want to talk about something worth worshiping? Why, the reason why? God's long suffering. But is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart. You know what God wants for you today? He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be that, That's his heart. That's his heart's cry. It's not sinning people. God has given, you know, and I don't under, all, understand it all. And I think we'll never all understand why God in creation would give us a choice. It would be a whole lot easier him just make us robots and say, you do this because I want you to. But God loves, if you, don't, if you don't know anything about God, God loves relationships. God created for relationships. Sin marred that relationship. And God, in his glorious work dealing with sin, provided a way so that we could have a relationship with him again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's heart. And if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you may be watching us on Facebook or, or YouTube, and if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, today is the day of salvation. That is God's will. It doesn't matter how long you've been in church. It doesn't matter how many times you've said the name of Jesus or, or the name of God. It doesn't matter how much you've given or what you've served. If you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my friends, your final destination is hell. Look what Jesus, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Are you that person? Well, let me ask, church member, how does hell affect you? We, we agree hell's real. It, re it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what, what other preachers may say or what books may write about. What matters is what God's word says. And it is real, and it is a place of agony and torment, and it is eternal, and it is a place for those that refuse Jesus Christ. But church member, how does that affect you? When was the last time tears were shed with the thought of one dying in their sins and their eternity being spent in hell? When, when, when you witness to someone... Is it about, I want to see that person saved so they have a relationship in eternity in heaven? Or, oh, if I get them saved or connected, that adds numbers to our church. Maybe that's the problem with churches today is we're so worried about numbers and packing pews that it's just full of lost people. God, as God won't use lost people to reach the world in the way that, that God sees fit he wants saved people reaching out that's the commission 
He wants saved people reaching out, teaching, preaching Jesus, discipling, baptizing. When was the last time hell just gripped us because there are those dying and heading there? without a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? When was the last time the good news of Jesus Christ was shared? Was it a week? Was it a day? Was it a month? Was it a year? Was it never? Say what I'll never forget. Meeting with the deacon. That first time after Brother Steve had called me. And we sat in Brother Charlie's office, and it was just kind of a get-to-know-you. Uh, I believe it was October of that year. And I had questions, and I, and I had a few, but it was kind of a, hey, if you're, you're, since you're coming through, would you sit? And so it wasn't even time to really think of anything. But you know one of the questions? about different places and all that but when was the last time you shared the gospel with someone folks hell should grip us in such a way that we take every single chance my friend final destination is one of two places it's either you end in heaven because You've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and it's not the other place. Or you'll end up in hell because you refuse Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Here's the real question. Where are you going to end up? What will be your final destination? Is it a place called heaven? Or is it a place called hell? Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning and we thank you. We thank you for the truths of your word. Lord, your word tells us that we're sinners. And Lord, we fall short of your glory. Your word tells us that the wages of our sin is death. Your word tells us we die in our sins, Lord. We're just like the rich man. And we'll wake up in torment and in e an eternal hell of, of pain and suffering and agony. Lord, you put that in your word not to scare. But it's the truth. Lord, I pray this morning if there's one here. Lord, I don't care if it's a boy or a girl or a man, woman. I don't care if they're the longest tenured member. I don't care if they're visiting. If someone is here, Lord, that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus. I don't care if they've talked a good talk. Lord, I pray that you would draw them today. Lord, and, and in this invitation, Lord, they realize their need. And Lord, in that moment, they, they turn to you. Lord, I pray that hell would grip us in such a way. Lord, that we would be willing to storm the gates of hell. With Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that he gives and the hope. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand. So we prepare for an invitation a song of response how do you need to respond this morning if you're here this morning and, and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus if you have I'd love right here on this altar to kneel down and share